So we are in week four of our series called Better, and we're talking about the fact that Jesus is greater than. Jesus is greater than. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the fact that Jesus is greater than our weaknesses, and, and we have weaknesses, don't we? There's things that we just stumble over again and again and again. We're like, oh my goodness, I, I should be able to over... Paul said this in Romans, he said, I do the things I don't want to do, and I don't do the things I do want to do, and ah, you can just kind of hear him screaming onto the, the paper, ah, what a wretched man I am, he says. So we have these weaknesses, and Jesus is greater than those weaknesses. And then last week, we talked about the fact that Jesus is greater than our failures, and those areas that we failed in our past, those areas that, that for some of us, they dominate our lives. We, we just can't seem to get over those failures in our lives, and, and we... We talked about the fact that Jesus is greater than that and that we can rely on him. We can lean into him and uh, we can find forgiveness and we can find wholeness despite our failures. Today I want to talk to you about this and the songs that the worship team did today have just so beautifully brought us into this moment together. I want to talk to you about the fact that Jesus is greater than the cross. Jesus is greater than the cross. Now, as I was thinking about and planning for this message, I got to thinking about how obsessed we are as a country, um, as a nation, um, even worldwide, globally, with celebrities. We're like obsessed with them, right? Um, I don't know if you watched the, the, the Oscars last Sunday. Um, I watched a little bit of it. It's just kind of like, oh my goodness, get over yourselves. Yeah, you're just not, it's, it's, it's a statue. People, you know, we give them out to third graders. Um, but, you know, just to kind of listen to people and watch and the whole red carpet thing. And people start watching these things at like 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And they have like pre-shows. It, it's like the Super Bowl now. They have pre-shows of the pre-shows of the pre-red carpet, red carpet, then the red carpet, then the post-red carpet, then the post-post of the red carpet, red carpet pre-show. Right? And uh, it's all confusing, and then they finally get to it, and you fall asleep about halfway through, like, you know. And, and the movies, like, I, I didn't see any of the movies. Like, nobody sees any of the movies that they nominate for Best Picture. Like, why can't we just put up Superman versus Batman? Wonder Woman was really good. That was much better than any of those other movies they put out there. I was like, these, you know, I don't want to see that. I, I want to watch, like, you know action figures come to life and whatnot these movies are horrible but anyways we live in this celebrity obsessed culture and a few years ago you might even remember that there was a tv show out called cribs okay i gotta do it how many of you have watched i've watched it. okay how many of you have watched mtv cribs right y yeah okay but did you know did you know that there was even a spinoff of Cribs about celebrities' mobile homes? Is, that, is the picture up there? That is Will Smith's $2.5 million mobile home. That, that the movie company bought for him when he's on set doing a movie. And that isn't even the interior pictures. I got to look at the interior pictures. It was crazy, crazy nice, right? So news about celebrities is huge business, isn't it? We have Us Magazine. We have People Magazine. We have E! News. We have Entertainment Tonight. We have Access Hollywood. These mag magazines and shows make a profit off of celebrity news. We want to see who's marrying who and who got divorced and our... our uh, uh, Jennifer Aniston and Brad Pitt going to get back together. And, you know, I go into the, into the uh, grocery store, and I'm like, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. That's stupid, ridiculous. Why would anybody read that? And somebody actually pays money for that? Are you kidding me, right? And we're so obsessed with this stuff. And, and there are TV and, and magazines and newspapers and all this stuff that are making money off of celebrities. Did you know, just one more piece of trivia here, did you know that when Michael Jackson died, there were 456 tweets per second? I could top that. When Steve Jobs died, there were almost 10,000 tweets per second. And here's what we know. 
If we're honest about it, we know this, that raising someone up too high almost inevitably destroys them. I mean, how many celebrities just this last year have been ruined by the Me Too scandal just this last year alone? Now, I'm not going to name names, but you know what I'm talking about. But you know who we can never lift too high? You know whose fame we can never make too glorious? Jesus. It's impossible to raise him too high. It's impossible to speak his name too much, sing his praise too loud, live too focused on his greatness. And just 30 years before Paul wrote the words of the text that we're going to read today, this guy that we're going to talk about today, he died on a Roman cross. Now, this is significant this morning because the cross was designed to be the most humiliating, horrible death available at that time. And so, so when Paul begins to write about Jesus and begins to write about the cross, it's a scandalous, it's a scandalous um, essay. It's a scandalous letter that he's writing. But think about this. 2,000 years later, we're still lifting high the name and the fame of Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to catch this morning. God willingly sacrificed his only son, and that is the greatest sign of devotion and love. And because Jesus willingly gave his life and died for you and me, this is our only hope. In other words, Jesus is all you need. Now, consider this juxtaposition this morning, that a murdered man is the king of everything. He's the king of everything. And when we consider the greatness of Jesus, it's based on the fact that Jesus is greater than the cross. As we've seen the past two weeks, Jesus is greater than our failures, and Jesus is greater than our weaknesses. But those truths are based on this truth that Jesus is greater than the cross, that Jesus overcame death for you and me. And because Jesus overcame the cross, you and I have this assurance that Jesus is greater than everything and anything we can ever or will ever encounter. So, if you're new to Shoreline Community Church, inside of your bulletin, there's a white piece of paper. And if you need a pen, one of our guys that I don't see right now, but one of our guys will be glad to get one for you. But you can follow along with us uh, with notes. And what that means for you and I today is this, that Jesus is great enough to claim the title of God. That Jesus is great enough to be called God. Now I want to read to you from Colossians chapter 1 this morning, and this is where we're going to be settled this morning. It says this, starting with verse 12, it says, He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Sound familiar? He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things that we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him, and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. Now, I read that and I go, now that's a resume, right? That's some resume. Now, we, we quantify greatness differently, don't we? Muhammad Ali called himself the greatest fighter that ever lived. And and I wondered this morning, is Tiger Woods or Jack Nicholas or Arnold Palmer the greatest golfer of all time? How do we judge how they dominated their area, era, excuse me, or the number of majors they've won, or is it the amount of money that they've made? And then I thought a little deeper, who's the world's greatest mom? Who is the world's greatest mom? Now, almost everyone in this room would argue that their mom is the world's greatest, which means that the only criteria, if we're honest about it, the only criteria for being the world's greatest mom is to have given you life. 
We all list a number of factors as to why we would vote for our mom. But at the end of the day, the real reason you and I think our mom is the greatest is that she gave you life. Which I would also argue is a pretty fair way to secure my vote. Mike Kruger writes this. How do you measure greatness? Is it measured by the reputation one leaves when he dies? By the amount of money one has, by the Nielsen ratings, by popularity polls, by how many homes a family has. In measuring your own greatness, do you compare yourself to others? Do you try to impress your peers? Or are you attempting to live up to someone else's expectations of you? Why do we call Jesus the greatest? Well, here's what we know. We know that Jesus is greater than angels. We know that Jesus is greater than time. We know that Jesus is greater than creation. And we know that Jesus is greater than death. And he's the first in everything, which means that because he died and came back, we will too. Jesus isn't the only one who's ever done it. Jesus is the first. All this leads to this conclusion. Jesus is great enough That we can feel confident calling him God. Secondly this morning, Jesus is the greatest because Jesus is great enough to save. Jesus is great enough to save. We continue on in this passage in Colossians. It says this, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth, by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence. You are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world. And I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. Now, in this portion of Scripture, two things jump out at me. First of all is this. You can trust Jesus' promises that he lived and died so you can be saved from sin and have a life that goes on forever and ever. Why can can we trust that we can have eternal life through Jesus? Because Jesus claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. And he said this, he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. And we can absolutely believe him because he also claimed that he would die and rise from the dead three days later. He kept that promise so we know that he keeps all promises. And listen to this, we have more historical fact or more historical proof For the death and the resurrection of Jesus than we do that Plato ever lived, that Homer ever lived, or many of the other historical figures that we just take for granted. We actually have more historical proof of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we can trust him because he promised that he would die and rise from the dead. So we know that we can trust him that he is the way, the truth, the life. He is the way to the Father. The second thing that jumped out at me in this portion of Scripture is this. Listen, church, we have to maintain our faith. We have to maintain our faith. Now, how do we do this? Follow me for just a second this morning. Jesus explains this to us in John chapter 14, verse 15, and he says this. If you love me, obey my commandments. If you love me, obey my commandments. Now, We can't say that we love him if we don't believe in him, can we? Can't love something I don't believe in. I can't have have feelings towards something that I don't believe in. So if we believe in him and if we love him, then what's the next step in this? Then we're going to do the things that he commanded us to do. And you go, oh my goodness, okay, well what did Jesus command us to do? In your notes, Jesus commanded us to do just two things, didn't he? He said, love God and love others. So all the commandments come down to these two things. If you're loving God and you're loving others, right, then you're following my commandments and you are showing that you love me. And if you're showing that you love me, then you're showing that you believe in me. 
In other words, if we maintain our faith in Christ, if we truly believe that he is who he said he is, and he did what we know he did, then we should have an ongoing, constantly growing relationship with our Heavenly Father. And like I said, we demonstrate our love for God by how we treat and interact with those who are around us. That's that's how you and I demonstrate our faith in Christ. Which brings us back to this truth that Jesus is great enough based on the fact that he has kept his promise to us and because history affirms that he has conquered death, we can trust that he is also great enough to save us. Thirdly this morning, Jesus is great enough to make our suffering worth it. Jesus is great enough to make our suffering worth it. Love what Paul says here in verse 24. He says, I'm glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. I hate that verse. I read that verse, I'm like, whoa, 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 this is a whole lot of suffering. I don't want to suffer. How many of you want to sign up for suffering? Okay, we got one taker here. So anybody who wants to beat up Chris, just, just have at that, right? Nobody wants to suffer. We get a cold and we're like, Jesus, don't take me home. Don't let this one be to death, I promise. Right? Come on. I get your phone calls. Yesterday, is Dan, Dan's not in here? Oh my goodness, this guy was whining about his blisters he got yesterday. Are you kidding me, Dan? You know, man, I got a blister here, I got a blister here, a blister here. You would have thought this guy, you know, we had tortured him or something, you know. Yeah, we don't like suffering. Suffering's for like people someplace else, right? But listen to this. Paul isn't saying Jesus' suffering wasn't enough to save you. Here's what he's saying. He's saying my suffering is like the leftovers of Jesus' suffering. He's saying it's only fitting that my suffering should correspond to Jesus. And he starts it all off with these words, I'm glad. Whoa, 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 whoa. Check this out in your notes this morning. I want you to catch this. In other words, the greatest testimony of Christ in your life may not be through your prosperity, but through your suffering. The greatest testimony of Christ in your life may not be through your prosperity, but through your suffering. That's a game changer, isn't it? When we join with Christ, when we suffer for his name, when we're ridiculed or misunderstood or taken advantage of or even persecuted for his name's sake, we are joining in the suffering that he endured. So Paul continues on, verses 25 and 26. He says, God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. Now, the word in other versions there that um, he used for kept secret is the word mystery. In the New Testament, it means something different than we would we would think of it. It means this. It means something that is that used to be hidden, but is now revealed. In other words, it used to be hidden from you, but now it's made plain. It used to be something you kind of thought about and didn't really understand. It was, it was a little murky, but now it's completely understandable. He said it used to be a mystery to you, but now it's plain. So what's he talking about? Let's go on here. For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. That's us, unless you're of Jewish descent here. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing in his glory. The good news is this. We not only join in his suffering, but what brings us joy is that we also join in his glory. So Paul says, I'm glad, let me suffer, because the suffering here translates to more glory on the other side. For thousands of years, people wondered, what's God up to? And God said, watch this, and at the right moment, 
he brought Jesus. And people said, how can God let this happen? And he gave Jesus. And people said, why can't God just come close? And you know what he did? He sent Jesus. People said, I wish I knew what God was really like. And Jesus. See, God didn't send Jesus just to show you the way. That wouldn't have been enough. God sent Jesus to die and to conquer death and to make a relationship possible with the Father. But it's not a someday kind of a relationship. It's not a when I die kind of a relationship. Jesus came and he died again and he did that so that he can live in you this morning. Amen. Amen. See, this is much more than I walked an aisle and prayed a prayer kind of a thing. This shuts every mouth that says, I can't be like that. Right? You meet those people, they say, oh, I wish I could be like you. I, I, I wish I could have that faith like you have. Oh, I, I, I wish I could be a Christ follower. I, I, I mean, I really do, but I'm different than you. I can't do it. And here's our response to that. I can't either. I'm a mess. But guess what? Christ lives in me. He's not out there someplace. I don't just read scripture and hope that I can figure it out and, and, and hope that maybe someday I can live up to it. No, he's living in me. He's changing me. I'm becoming a new creation in Christ Jesus, not because he's someplace else and I'm trying to murkily walk this kind of path. He lives in me and he is guiding my life. We're this way because Christ is in us. Okay, so that's the secret. It's out of the bag, isn't it? That Christ is in us. That's how we do it. It's no longer me, it's Christ in me, helping me, changing me, rearranging my priorities and values and ideology. The secret this morning is this, that Christ now resides in me. He lives, he lives in me. As the worship team comes. Paul continues, he says, so we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. And we want to present them to Christ, perfect in their relationship to Christ. He says, that's why I work and struggle so hard depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. In other words, why do you do this, Paul? Why did you go to jail? Why do you suffer? Why do you teach when people ignore you? Why subject yourself to the abuse and the humiliation and suffering in your notes this morning so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ? Jesus came for whosoever. We're not selective, right? We're a come as you are, church. We're a come as you are, Christ follower. We're as a come as you are, people. It's not for some and excludes others. It's not for the good people and when we forget about the bad people. It's not for the people who are raised in church and all of you other people. It's not, it's not for the Protestants and not you Catholics and not the Jews and not the Mormons and not, right? It's a whosoever will come kind of a thing this morning. We want everyone to made per, be made perfect in Christ. Why? Because he's changed us from the inside. Amen? Do I believe that Jesus can do in you what he has done for me? Yes. Why? Because Jesus is great enough. If Jesus could be greater than death, if Jesus who died a death that was intended to humiliate him, right? And now we wear crosses as a symbol of triumph, then he is truly enough to save you. He's greater than your pastor. He's greater than your church. He's greater than your righteousness. He's greater than your brain. He's greater than your opinions. He's greater than the biggest thought you've ever had about him this morning. Jesus is greater than your depression. He's greater than your joblessness. He's greater than your hopelessness. He's greater than the abuse you've suffered. He's greater than the scars that you bear from an unkind parent. He's greater than the doubts that you have. He's a greater than the addiction you may be bound by. He's greater than the shame of your past. And you may say, but I, you don't know what I've done, pastor. You don't know what I've done. Well, I want you to hear the words of Jesus in Matthew. He says this. He says, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. Can you turn this monitor off? Yes, Father. It pleased you to do it this way. My Father has entrusted everything to me, he goes on to say. 
No one truly knows the Son except the Father. And no one truly knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Can I tell you this morning? He's revealing himself to you this morning. Then Jesus said, listen, if you say he can't do this for me, you don't know my past, you don't know what I've done. Listen to what Jesus says. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give is light. You know what we do? We place crosses at the front of churches as a symbol, not of death, but of life. Why? Because Jesus is greater than the cross. And because he is greater than the cross, you and I can rest assured that he is greater than anything we've ever faced, endured, or even the things that we've caused this morning. He's greater. But there's a catch. Ah, some of you just went, I knew it. I knew there was a catch. I knew it. You want to know what the catch is? We can't claim these benefits unless we come to him. It's not really that ridiculous if you think about it. I mean... A citizen of Uzbekistan can't get Social Security in America. Why? Because they're not a citizen of that country. In the same way, we can't claim the promises of the Bible unless we're citizens of heaven. And so Jesus simply says, you want me to take your burdens? You want me to take your shame? You want me to take the weariness of your soul and replace it with my rest, my righteousness? my love, my grace, my peace, then come to me. Come to me. And I wonder this morning, would you come? Would you come to a Jesus who is greater than your weaknesses? Would you come to a Jesus who is greater than your failures? Would you come to a Jesus who's greater than the cross? Would you stand with me this morning? In your bulletins, or on your notes, excuse me, I put three responses to this morning's message. The first is this. Maybe you're here and you're like, okay, pastor, you've piqued my interest. And you'd say, I want to explore farther the the claims of Christ. You know what? I'm going to look into this a little more. I'm going to be intellectually open. And I'm going to be spiritually open to understand the claims of Christ. Maybe you're at another place. Maybe you've been exploring. Maybe you've been looking into it and you've been searching your heart. And you'd say, today's the day that I want to come. Today I'm going to come to Christ. Today I'm going to make Him Lord. I'm going to stop trying to do it my way. I'm going to stop living in my shame. I'm going to stop trying to be good enough. and I'm going to stop trying to... to live up to some kind of standard that I can't, I'm just going to come. I'm going to replace my burden for his, which is light. I'm going to replace my shame for his righteousness. I'm going to to exchange all of the guilt that I feel and the lostness and the emptiness I feel. I'm going to replace it for his righteousness. See, we can't be any of those on our own. We have to come to him. And then the last thing I put here is this. I'm going to stop complaining about the suffering I experience. Instead, I'm going to rejoice because I'm participating in the sufferings of Christ, which means that my suffering is not in vain. Maybe you're here today and it feels like the whole world's against you. You just feel like every turn. God's saying, whoa, 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 whoa. You give that to me. And I'll replace it for glory on the other side. Our lives are a vapor. Nobody gets to the end of their life and go, yep, it's a pretty good time. You know what everybody says? Wish I had more time. Yeah, but you're 187. Yeah, I'd like a few more days. Went fast. The older you get, the faster it you realize it goes. 
So this momentary suffering, guess what? It's going to be replaced for eternal glory. So we have to keep things in perspective. Whatever it is, no matter how great it is, you go, oh, Pastor, you don't know. I, 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 I. Whatever it is, I can tell you right now, it wasn't on par with Paul. That dude, go check out his story. Spend a night out in the open seas in rough waters. And he did it more than once. In the winter, I might add. Talk to me about suffering. Paul goes, oh yeah, I'm, I'm glad. This is all good stuff. Because it's better on the other side. Church, we got to stop complaining about our, our blisters. Amen? Not so bad. That was me. That, that was me talking about me. I'm the biggest whiner in the room, right? Would you close your eyes for just a moment, church? We're almost done, I promise. I just sense, I sense the Holy Spirit working this morning. I sense the Holy Spirit is just speaking into your ear right now. Some of you are saying, come, just come. Yeah, but I don't have all the answers. None of us have all the answers. Welcome to the club. Yeah, but I'm not good enough. There's nobody in this room. I know everybody in this room. Nobody's good enough. Right? We're all just broken people who trust God. If you're here this morning and you're going to be marking your paper, I'm coming to Jesus. Would you just raise your hand real quick? Just up, down. That's all. Just let me know. There we go. Hands all over the room. Anyone else? Yes. I'm tired of doing it my way. How about I just do it God's way? Thanks for that hand. You can put it back down. Anyone else? Just a moment more. Come on. Thank you for that hand. Did I respond to Pastor Paul? I promise. Thank you for that hand. Can we just pray a prayer right now to solidify that? I'll say it, and then I'm going to ask everybody to follow along. Can I tell you, the power is not in the prayer. The power is in giving your life fully to Christ and following His ways. That's it. Just coming. Just coming. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for being raised from the dead so that I can have eternal life. I come to you today a sinner, broken, incomplete, and I acknowledge that I need you. I ask you to cleanse me and set me on a firm foundation. I commit today to follow you, to trust you. Thank you for changing me. Amen. Lord, I pray for everybody in this room this morning as we close out this service. I pray that we would... Stop relying on ourselves. Stop relying on our, our own goodness or our own righteousness. Or God, we would just relax. Because you are greater than the cross, we could trust you. Because you died and rose again, we have this confidence that everything you've promised us is true. And that means that you're the only way to the Father. And that means today that we have this beautiful, blessed hope of eternal life. So we commit ourselves this morning, we commit ourselves to stop relying on ourselves, but also we commit ourselves to remember that our suffering has an end to it. And that end is that we spend glory with you. That our suffering isn't wasted. That it, it's good for us. And Lord, while we aren't really welcoming suffering necessarily. Lord, we're going to use it for what it's intended for. To grow us, to build us, to correct us sometimes. But Lord, ultimately, it works together for our good. And we acknowledge that this morning. So Lord, I pray your blessing upon everyone as we head back into our regular week. In Christ's name, amen. Now, May the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd 
of the sheep and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. May he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. Have a great week. We love you.